Good evening. Well, basically, the bill we're talking about tonight is a paradigm shift from anything you've seen before and anything, that, anything else you'll see in the state of Idaho this year. First, you have to recognize what we're talking about when we say end abortion is this is a human rights movement. That's the bottom line. The pointy end of the spear that we're talking about tonight is a piece of legislation, a proposed bill that would actually criminalize all abortions in the state of Idaho. And the reason it's the pointy end of the spear is it's because our civil government has been given the charge. Its duty is to enact and enforce just law. And that begins with good criminal law. Now, because abortion actually is the crime of murder, then it's civil government's job to establish and administer a murder law or a criminal law against abortion. Now, remember, I talked about a paradigm shift. Now, I want to talk about the critical, huge brick wall of the old paradigm so that you can understand where we are coming from tonight. So I'm going to take you back to the 1960s, back up here for a minute. In 1967, states actually began legalizing abortion way before the Roe v. Wade decision. And the circumstances that came up in Roe v. Wade, what was being tested, what was being challenged, were the Texas criminal abortion statutes. And that's actually what you see on the screen right here. This is what the law was. When I talk about a human rights movement, 30 states at the time of Roe v. Wade in 1973 had laws against abortion, but not a single one treated the pre-born human being the same as the rest of us. There was no equal protection under the law, even at that time. This is the Texas abortion laws. It was two to five years imprisonment for abortion. It was only for the abortionist, not for the mother. Accomplices were criminally liable. If you attempted an abortion, you tried to kill a child and you failed, that was against the law. And none of this applied if the mother's life or health were in danger, you could get an abortion in that case. So that was what was being tested in Roe v. Wade. Texas had to come to the Supreme Court to defend their law. And the main argument they made was a constitutional argument based on the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And Texas tried to say that the pre-born human being was a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment. However, the Supreme Court actually looked at Texas criminal statutes and they said, we got a problem with that, and they wrote about that in the Roe v. Wade opinion. It's in the body of the opinion, and it's in footnote 54, and here's what they said. If the fetus is a person who is not to be deprived of life without due process of law, and if the mother's condition is the sole determinant does not the Texas exception appear to be out of line with the 14th Amendment? What black men in their decision is addressing here is if you're going to let an innocent person be killed just because another person's life or health is in danger, that would seem to suggest that the innocent person does not actually have constitutional human rights. Then he went on. He says there's other inconsistencies. You can see the Supreme Court's looking at the hypocrisy of Texas law and what Texas is now claiming in front of the court. In Texas, the woman is not a principal or an accomplice with respect to an abortion upon her. If the fetus is a person, why is the woman not a principal or accomplice? Good question. Also, the penalty for criminal abortion, remember this is all in Roe v. Wade, in Article 1195, the penalty is significantly less than the maximum penalty for murder in the Texas Penal Code. If the fetus is a person, Blackman asks, may the penalties be different? Great question. Well, here's what Rose said. So here's what the court decided after looking at the hypocrisy of Texas's abortion laws. They actually said, you know what? Rather than the preborn human being being a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment, we're going to focus on the next word in the 14th Amendment, liberty, and we are going to say that mothers have the liberty, a right to privacy found in that word liberty, to hire an assassin, to kill their preborn child, and then listen to this condition further. That liberty exists until the preborn baby is 24 weeks gestation. The state only develops a compelling interest 
after 24 weeks gestation. That's the decision in Roe v. Wade. Now, a lot of people think, oh, it's Roe v. Wade. All we got to do is knock off Roe v. Wade. And if we can get the Supreme Court to reverse that decision, then the states can make their own laws about abortion. But check this out. There's actually 37 Supreme Court decisions over the decades. Remember, it's been 46 years since Roe v. Wade. Here's the decisions in the 1970s. Here's the decisions in the 1980s. Here's the decisions in the 1990s. These are Supreme Court decisions where they had the ability to address whether abortion is actually a constitutional right. Here's the early 2000s. And we've actually only had one in the last 10 years. It was in 2016. So we have monumental Supreme Court jurisprudence on this question. Now, not only that, now remember, the way we got here is we never had just law to begin with. Now, not only that, but we also have a lot of federal courts besides the Supreme Court. And I always like to pull in the most recent published opinion of a court on this question about what the jurisprudence is of the Supreme Court. Now, you see this map here. When we talk about appeals courts, these are the federal appeals court boundaries, and so we talk about circuits. There's 11 circuits for appeals courts in the United States. You see at the bottom of your screen there is Texas. It's in the Fifth Circuit and includes Louisiana and Mississippi. Well, we have such recent decisions coming out of the Fifth Circuit. Mississippi, last year, 2018, passed an abortion ban where at 15 weeks, they said no abortions could be performed. Is 15 weeks before 24? Yes. So here's your decision published December 13th, 2019. That was nine days ago from what is considered a conservative appeals circuit. It actually even has one Trump appointee right now. This was Jackson Women's Health Organization versus Dobbs, US Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. This is the quote from the opinion. In an unbroken line dating to Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court's abortion cases have established and affirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed 37 times a woman's right to choose an abortion before viability. Also part of the opinion, states may regulate abortion procedures prior to viability so long as they do not impose an undue burden on the woman's right, but they may not ban abortions before 24 weeks. Mississippi law at issue is a ban, a 15-week ban. Thus, we affirm the district court's invalidation of the law. So basically what you have here is a federal court nine days ago saying that Mississippi may not ban abortions at 15 weeks. I've really got to get this in your heads. If I can emphasize one thing, the federal courts to the states have issued a commandment, thou shalt not ban any abortions before 24 weeks gestation. Now, what have been the... Now, I want to tell you that it's not the Supreme Court opinion that is the law. Rather, what's happened then is all of the states act as if the Supreme Court opinion is law, and they then go make laws enacting the Supreme Court opinion. That's how it actually works. So in Idaho, we have laws on our books that permit abortion. That's what you saw in that first video. Now, in the last 10 years, we've been playing what I call the judicial supremacy game. The judicial supremacy game looks like this in the state of Idaho. There have been 18 pro-life bills proposed since 2010 in the state of Idaho. I'm going to give you examples. 2011, it's the fourth line down on that screen. This is on our website, abolishabortionid.com. We are one of the first states to pass a 22-week abortion ban. Sometimes you've heard it called a 20-week ban. I won't get into how, why it's actually not. But it was called the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. 2011. Naturally, the Idaho District Court said that is a ban. That would be the federal court. Said that's a ban before 24 weeks. And so they ordered us not to enforce it. We complied. 
The Ninth Circuit affirmed in 2013, you may not enforce that ban, so we complied. I'll give you another example. In 2015, we passed a telemed abortion ban that basically you could talk to a doctor from southeastern Idaho, you could talk, talk to an abortionist in Boise, get prescribed RU 46, 486 over the telephone or by computer. It was a telemed abortion, and we said you cannot do that. And the federal court said that's a ban. We told you you cannot place any substantial obstacle or undue burden between a woman and her right to kill her child. So in 2017, one of the pro-life laws was actually a pro-abortion law. Our state legislature came back and reversed that telemed abortion ban. Now, the eternal hope of the good conservative pro-lifers is that, well, we're stuck with this situation where the Supreme Court has ruled, we must obey, we must elect pro-life presidents, conservative presidents who will appoint pro-life conservative justices who will then one day reverse Roe v. Wade. Well, let's see how that's worked out for us. Up on the screen here is the court as it existed at Roe v. Wade. On the left-hand side of the screen, you have the seven justices who voted for Roe v. Wade. They say that there is a right to abortion. On the right side of your screen is the two justices who voted against it. You'll notice there's red boxes. Well, the court at that time was six to three Republican appointees. And you actually had one Republican appointee and one Democrat appointee appointed by Kennedy, Byron White, who said, no, we don't think it's a right. So that was your Supreme Court makeup at Roe v. Wade in 1973. So then Gerald Ford became president. He got one appointment to the Supreme Court. Then Ronald Reagan, a pro-life president, conservative Republican, became president. He got three appointments to the United States Supreme Court. George H.W. Bush became president. He got two appointments to the United States Supreme Court. Now, check this out. In Bush's term in the early 1990s, the Supreme Court is eight to one Republican versus Democrat appointee. And do you see which Democrat appointee is on that court? It's Byron White. He voted against Roe v. Wade. Okay? Now, a case comes up to the Supreme Court, like that big list you saw from the 1990s, and it was a significant case because it really, I can't tell you the result yet. It was called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and here was your result. Five justices on the Supreme Court voted to essentially expand abortion rights. This is where they came up with that language that you may not place any substantial obstacle or undue burden between a woman and her abortion. And do you see the right side of your screen? Some of those justices that were newly appointed did, the two of them, Thomas and Scalia, did vote the right way, but guess what? Scalia's gone, Rehnquist is gone, Byron White's gone, Clarence Thomas is the only one left. And just so you know, when we talk about abortion jurisprudence at the Supreme Court, 15 of the last 19 Supreme Court justices have been Republican appointees. Don't put your hope in the Republican appointees. Here's the result of this judicial supremacy game. 28 children will be murdered this week, even Christmas week in the state of Idaho. It's been going on for decades to the tune of tens of thousands of children murdered in the state of Idaho under the protection of our laws. Now here's what the Constitution actually says, and John's going to talk about this in detail. What does the Constitution actually say? Not only about what are the rights of people, but what are the enumerated powers given to the state versus the federal government. It says in Article 6, and this is what all of our representatives and our governor take an oath to uphold, it says that the Constitution, this is what's called the Supremacy Clause, by the way. People will say the Supremacy Clause says that the Supreme Court decisions are the supreme law of the land. You'll actually hear that connection, and they're not. The Supremacy Clause actually says that the Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. And all of our legislators take an oath to uphold that statement right there. Now, 
Our founders did not actually envision that we would be ruled by a Supreme Court oligarchy. The language that you hear, Supreme Court issues a ruling, is not actually what happens. They issue an opinion. And Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers number 81, see, they were worried that we'd end up in this situation. Yeah. So the writers of the Federalist Papers said, hey, look, don't worry, the judiciary, we're not exchanging a monarchy for an oligarchy. An oligarchy is like a few kings, nine of them. They wear black robes. We're not doing that because guess what? And this is the way it typically works in state courts. It just isn't working that way in the federal courts. If you don't like a decision that the court made, guess what the legislature can do? It can go prescribe a new rule for future cases. It can say Roe v. Wade decision only applies to Norma McCorvey, not to everything else. Also, the Congress can remove justices. Nobody seems to know that. It's called good behavior. Now, also, have you ever noticed that the Supreme Court does not have a police force? It doesn't run any prisons or jails. It has no military. You guys notice that about the Supreme Court? They have no power. Alexander Hamilton said this, particular misconstructions and contraventions of the will of the legislature may happen. In other words, the court may go against the legislative will. Legislatures make laws, courts don't. That may happen, but they can never affect the order of the political system. The judiciary has comparative weakness and total incapacity to support its usurpations by force. What that means is where it assumes to itself power that it doesn't have, it can't enforce that. It has no actual power except the fact that we cooperate with it. So this year, you're going to see in the Idaho legislature three bills related to abortion. You're going to see our bill, and you're going to see two others. I need to go over what the differences are so you can recognize the new paradigm versus the old paradigm. You're going to see a heartbeat bill. Remember Mississippi had that 15-week abortion ban? They actually passed a heartbeat bill this past year. So this same court that just struck down their 15-week ban, a heartbeat bill is a six-week ban. Is that going to pass court muster? Nope. You're, you're going to see that in the state of Idaho. This session starts in two weeks. You're also going to see another bill that looks exactly like the Texas laws before Roe v. Wade that were being challenged by Roe v. Wade. Those two bills have one thing in common. They think that the court makes laws and that we must obey the unlawful opinions of the Supreme Court. Well, people will say, Scott, the states can't ignore Supreme Court opinions. States can't defy the federal government. Anybody recognize this plant? <laughs> what you don't know is that there's an actual federal statute passed by the Congress in 1970, signed by Richard Nixon, called the Controlled Substances Act. And in it, marijuana is a Schedule I drug. It's illegal to possess or distribute marijuana. Not only that, but there is a Supreme Court decision, Gonzalez versus Raich, 2005, and involved a case in California, where the federal government, the Supreme Court said under the Interstate Commerce Clause, the federal government can come into your state and enforce their criminal marijuana laws. Well, how come the states have not rolled over and said the Supreme Court has ruled we must obey? Instead, 11 states have broadly legalized marijuana, possession and distribution. 33 more states have legalized at least the medical use of marijuana. Idaho is one of six holdouts at this point. Well, this is the pro-life movement right here. That's your pro-life lobby. Why would I put that up there? We're going to play the same game of judicial supremacy? That's not what this bill is about. That's why it's a new paradigm. On the left is your Abortion Human Rights Act. On the right is your heartbeat bill or any other pro-life bill you see this session. Abortion Human Rights Act criminalizes all abortion. It defies judicial supremacy. There are no abortions that would be legal in the state of Idaho. Abortion centers would close because they'd be prosecuted for a serious crime. 28 babies a week would no longer be murdered under the protection of Idaho law. 
There would be equal protection, equal treatment, equal justice in our law. The heartbeat bill, it's a judicial supremacist bill. The other pro-life bill you're going to see, judicial supremacist. It's going to get blocked by the courts. Idaho taxpayers, why? Because it bans it before 24 weeks. Idaho taxpayers are going to pay Planned Parenthood's legal fees. The Supreme Court oligarchy is going to be strengthened because we're going to continue to act like they're actually legitimate in this question. Pro-life politicians will put the latest bill on their re-election card that you get in the mail. And they'll say, I'm pro-life, vote for me. And I am not questioning their motives, I'm not ascribing their motives, but it is what happens, is it not? And then pro-life lobbyists are going to raise more money for their next judicial supremacy bill. And when you give a politician something easy to do, they will take it every time. Let's not go for it. We can abolish abortion this legislative session in the state of Idaho. 